Tonight, it was always the plan. Boris Johnson tells his party the stresses and strains we're about to see are all part of economic revival. They loved it in the hall. Will they believe it in the country? How did petrol queues and labour shortages and inflation fears all become part of the Conservatives' plan for government? The PM promises his vision will end immigration to bring growth and productivity. We ask how that might work. Also tonight, the Foreign Office responds to Newsnight's investigation on the Afghans sent towards imminent danger as they tried to flee Kabul. Oh, hello, it's Dr. Alan here from Burley Health Centre. And 20 months after Covid hit, how is the GP service coping or not coping? The real issue is not um, whether people are being so seen face to face. The real issue is that there just isn't enough capacity within general practice to see all the people who want to be seen. Hello, good evening. For nearly an hour this morning, we were allowed to forget rising energy prices and queues at the petrol stations, looming shortages and forecasts of soaring inflation. In 45 minutes, the Prime Minister took us to sunlit uplands where there was no mention of the hardships to come and no proffered solutions to the supply squeeze heading our way this winter. Instead, a promise from the PM that this was all part of the plan. He offered us beavers, broadband, teacher bonuses and his cabinet's own Bon Jovi. He pilloried and invented land where school sports races had no winners. He redrew a real land in which the Kabul airlift had been a triumph. In between, there was the promise of big, brave change to redistribute wealth and opportunity across the country. If this happens, then all else will rightly be a footnote. But tonight come voices from across the spectrum questioning his economic literacy, asking how the wealth and the opportunity so desperately needed can emerge from the limitations we are putting upon ourselves. We'll analyse the way productivity could emerge from this new model in a moment. But first, we go to Nick Watt. Nick, what have you got for us? Well, Emily, it's the end of the conference season for the main GB-wide parties. And at this stage, you want to know what are the dividing lines mm. between them. And tonight, Keir Starmer, well, he's had his say in response to Boris Johnson's speech. And we're beginning to get an answer to that question. Now, Number 10 believes that he walked into a trap before his conference when he suggested yes to 100,000 visas for lorry, driver, but lorry drivers. Boris Johnson set that at 5,000. He says that's called controlled immigration. Now, tonight, Keir Starmer on the Peston show has been talking about meeting the need uh, for the number of lorry drivers. He says we'll have the number that are necessary. So if it's 100,000, then it's 100,000. The view in number 10 is you, Keir Starmer, appeared not to have learnt the lesson of Brexit, the need to control immigration. And if you go for that lever, then that's all about low wages, which Boris Johnson was today saying he wants to end. The view from Keir Starmer is you, Boris Johnson, don't understand just how serious this crisis is. So there are the battle lines as Boris Johnson faced his party in person for the first time since his election win. Waiting in anticipation, lining up, in some cases for hours to hear from a leader who first made his name on the fringes but who now unquestionably commands centre stage. And today with his own special stage for a speech to a party celebrating its election victory nearly two years on. But a speech that would also be heard by a country facing multiple challenges. We, you all, represent the most jiving, hip, happening and generally funkopolitan party in the world. Vintage Boris Johnson with a joke to illustrate his fundamental political message. I will let the sun shine. So, no traditional list of fresh policy announcements and little notice of preparations for what ministers expect to be a tough winter as fuel prices increase. And we are going to deal with the biggest underlying issues of our economy and society. The Instead, an explanation of how the twin challenges of Covid and Brexit allow him to remodel our economy. Because we are embarking now on a change of direction that has been long overdue in the UK economy. We're not going back to the same old broken model with low wages, low growth, low skills and low productivity, all of it enabled and, in, and assisted by uncontrolled immigration. There will be bumps. Yes, it will take time. 
and sometimes it will be difficult. But that was the change that people voted for in 2016. And, and the theme the he knows is crucial to retaining the Tories' red wall seats, levelling up to provide help to areas which feel left behind, an outline of his ambition and a dividing line with Labour. And let's be clear that there is a huge philosophical difference between us and Labour because in their souls, they don't like levelling up. They don't like levelling up. They like levelling down. <laughs> they, they do. They, li they like... They like decapitating the tall poppies and squee and taxing the rich till the pips squeak and... From the cabinet, naturally, they were delighted. Fantastic, full of strategic vision, direction and a massive buzz of pent-up energy as we come out of this pandemic. Did you think it was a bit, some people might say it was a bit light on policy? No, it was very strong on strategic direction and unpacking all of the things that we want to achieve. And but full of vision, full of optimism. But is there a danger that with sort of, you know, such a sunny speech, you look a bit out of touch maybe with a country that does have grave problems? The Prime Minister recognises what needs to be done and he's set out what the future is and it's a very optimistic future. And that's what he does. He's, his optimism and his vision is first class. And I was absolutely delighted. It was a fantastic speech. It was very forward-looking. It gave a vision of where we're going in the future and I thought it was just brilliant. Now, we all know that he likes to sort of paint a positive vision, but that meant that there wasn't oh, much substance. Oh, come on, Nick. Substance. We're the fastest growing economy in the G7. We're getting gigagigat broadband in the ground, target 68% by, by the new year. We're delivering on skills. We're doing a huge amount. There was, it was not a lack of substance. There was a lot of substance in that speech. Is there a danger that you can look out of touch, not understanding the very real challenges out there. Oh no, look, he addressed how tough it's been, but no one wants to be an Eeyore about it. We saw the snooze fest that was the Labour Party conference. If all you do is hang around saying, oh, everything's dire, everything's terrible, without a positive alternative, you're not going to get the support. Yeah, and, and, and that accusation's been thrown at Boris since before he was Mayor of London, and yet, and yet, and yet, you know, he keeps getting elected, and he actually keeps, more importantly, keeps delivering. And family on hand too. About that, how's the family? The family difference is on Brexit. Is that all resolved now? Are you Build friends? Back. We're building back Beaver now, Nick. You're behind this curve. Bye. Harmony, now that the Prime Minister is championing Beavers. Packing up now after a supremely confident speech in which Boris Johnson effectively declared, in this arena, I set the rules. And so he painted a picture of sunny uplands and how he sees opportunity in what many regard as an evolving economic crisis. But outside events do have a habit of intruding in halls like this. And he may well find that if fuel continues to be disruptive and if energy prices continue to spike, then the usual rules demanding an immediate prime ministerial response may apply even to him. The end of the show, and down with a bang. Just memories from today, but a theme likely to endure. Nick, what there? Well, the PM told us today that by ending immigration, he can push up wages and get higher growth and productivity. The end of immigration may push up wages, but there's nothing to dictate this helps the economy to grow. Indeed, we have a woeful recent history of productivity, and the comparatively impressive productivity of neighbours like Germany is heavily reliant on a large labour market. So how do we get Britain to prosper? What does it take? Here's Lewis Goodall. Yes, Emily, the PM and Chancellor said today that we are not going back to the same old broken model with, quote, low wages, low growth, low skills and low productivity, all of it enabled and assisted by uncontrolled immigration. Well, let's examine that idea. For a start, Boris Johnson is right about something. We do have a productivity problem, productivity being how much each worker in the economy produces when it's going up. We get richer, generally wages go up too. And as you can see here from this graph, it has been stagnant productivity per worker pretty much since 2008. And that's one of the reasons why wage growth has been so stagnant as well. But can we say that's because of immigration? Well, let's take a look at this. This is Britain's productivity per hour in US dollars but ranked against other G7 nations. And you'll see here, the UK in the middle, but it's lower than France, the US and Germany. But of course, France and Germany 
are in the European Union. They were and are in the single market for Labour. Granted, they didn't have quite as much Eastern European immigration to begin with as we did, but they are similarly immigrant-rich countries, and it hasn't stopped them from having economies which are more productive than our own. And compare as well, actually, incidentally, to Japan. Japan is a country with very little immigration, but it's less productive than any other country in the G7. There simply isn't a hard link necessarily between productivity and migration in the way that has been described. And the danger is not only that productivity doesn't necessarily rise if you reduce immigration, but also that it can go down. Artificially creating labour shortages isn't a great way to, to boost productivity. For a start, managers of businesses are going to have to spend lots of time trying to find workers rather than boosting the efficiency of their companies. Uh, but also it can disrupt the economy in all sorts of ways that are, that are not helpful. So if we're short of fuel and food and all sorts of other things, then uh, we're hardly going to be more productive as a result. Um, it's possible that in the longer term, there will be a small boost to, to wages and to, and to productivity. But I think the impact of uncontrolled immigration on, on, on both of those is probably exaggerated. Part of the PM's thesis is that British businesses have relied on foreign labour as a means of foregoing investment in British staff, training, facilities and so on. But again, in aggregate, at least, the facts tell a rather different story. Take a look at this. This is British corporate investment over time. Now, as you can see, it's been reasonably strong. The blue line shows UK business investment growth since 1997 as the base year. It grows strongly again in the years leading up to 2008 when there was loads of immigration uh, from the EU and then falls back after the financial crash, slowly recovering after 2010, levelling off actually as concerns over Brexit started to loom and falling off again over a cliff during the pandemic. But again, that's not about immigration, but wider political decisions. What definitely boosts, boosts productivity, though, is improvements in skills, education, infrastructure and economic performance between regions. Look at this map here. Uh, the uh, blue regions here, they'll have areas with very high productivity, the pink areas with low. London, way out in front in terms of productivity per person, way out in front in terms of the north, lagging behind the average. But immigration isn't going to make much difference to that because some of the regions with the lowest productivity, like the north or northern Ireland, already have the lowest immigration levels by comparison to places like London. And let's be clear, governments have been trying to do something about this disparity for years. We didn't call it levelling up, but it isn't a new objective. It's just that it's hard and takes a long time and clever policy. And on the detail of policy on levelling up and skills and boosting productivity in that way, we're still to see much of the meat. We certainly didn't at conference. And the danger is that if you get a reduction in labour in, say, agriculture or HGVs and you reduce the labour supply because you want to reduce to raise wages, that's fine. You'll definitely raise wages. But if you don't boost productivity with it, all that happens, because that worker is just producing the same as she was yesterday, is that it costs more. That cost can only either be absorbed by the business, reducing profit and investment, or it's passed on to the consumer, all of us, in the form of higher prices, inflation, which in the end means that even those who've had their wages raised might not benefit very much because they're not able to buy as much with it. And it's not as if there aren't other reasons to worry about inflation at the moment. Some of it as a result of the pandemic. We'll work through. But take a look at this. This is the uh, cost of price of wholesale gas. Today, going up by nearly 40%, 40% in one day, an all-time high. And if we add that... Significant weight to significant wage push inflation onto that again without productivity gains, which could take a long time. We could be looking at a significant inflationary situation. The government is basically making a bet that businesses can absorb all of these changes without significant economic effects in the rest of the economy. Potentially, it's a very big bet indeed. Lewis, thanks very much indeed. We'll be speaking to Jonathan Reynolds, Labour Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, in a second. But first, uh, we go to Joe Gideon, the Conservative MP for Stoke-on-Trent Central. I know you want to speak to us uh, on, on your own first, um, Joe. And there was this marvellous feeling of optimism uh, for many in the hall today, but the trouble is it doesn't match with the reality of the direction in which we're heading for many on the outside. Um, well, I don't agree. I mean, the optimism uh, is very much about having a, a, a vision for, for the future and, and understanding that, you know, the challenges that we have coming out of a pandemic is something that, um, that needs to be tackled. So we, we, are, we are realistic um, that there are challenges and, and nobody's shying away from that. The Prime Minister certainly wasn't. But I think people need to, to understand that we, we know um, what needs to happen. Everybody was very keen to hear about the levelling up agenda. 
uh, and and he laid it out, I think, very clearly. He, he did shy away from talking about the reality of rising gas prices, as we've heard from Lewis, of the worker shortages, of the energy crisis, of the emergency uh, culls that are going on in farming, though. Wasn't that the tone of a prime minister in denial? Absolutely not. He didn't shy away from... Um, the, those specific issues, because he was focusing on a, a, a vision. You know, that, that, that's what you would expect from a prime minister at, at a party conference. Um, it, and, except, and, Joe, it's a vision that's been called economically illiterate by many business voices, many on the, the right of your party, who were saying it doesn't add up. You can't stop immigration, see wages rise, and think that's automatically going to lead to growth and productivity. It doesn't. It just creates more inflationary pressures? So, uh, I mean, the right of the party, uh, I think you're, you're talking about the, the suggestion that um, we, we're making some of the tough decisions, uh, like so the so decision on social care, um, where um, we, we are a party that, that doesn't... Um, Increase taxes without, without um, you know, it's reluctant. But Sorry, we are not, facing not, up to those. Not, not those to, not to, not to butt in, but just to correct yes. you. No, I'm talking about people. That the, the point I just made before, businesses. You were always the party of business, and now there are many business people in your party who just say it's economically illiterate. How can you, how can you shrink the size of the labour workforce and expect the economy to grow and productivity to grow? You might see wages go up, but that won't lead to a healthier economy. It will be the opposite. It will be inflationary. Oh, so, so we're not shrinking the size of, of, of the workforce. Uh, we've got um, a million job vacancies at the moment, but we've got also unemployment. You know, uh, I mean, we when we went into the pandemic, it was predicted that we would have um, more than uh, two million more unemployed than we actually have. So, I mean, it's 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 a success story of uh, furlough and of the four hundred billion that was invested. Uh, to to keep both people and businesses safe but during the pandemic. You'll appreciate, pandemic, you'll appreciate what they're saying, that, 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 that they come to you as Conservatives thinking you are the free market, you are, you are believers in capitalists, and they are now terrified of this, frankly, statist approach, that they are, concede, they are ceding, if you like, control to the government, red tape, bureaucracy, other people's rules. H how can you carry on being the party of business and not letting them actually grow and prosper? We, we uh, I'm sorry, I don't recognise that that description at all. I mean, I, I'm I'm out there meeting businesses every day. I mean, and two things: they are both enormously grateful for the support that they've had from government during the pandemic, and also very much looking forward to um, being part of this massive plan for jobs, where they have support with apprenticeships, with kickstart schemes to take new people on. Um, I mean, in, in my own constituency, there is a massive commitment from local businesses to support local okay. young people, you know. Um, uh, so I, I, I really don't recognise what yeah. you're saying. And certainly... Okay. You know, uh, sorry, finish your sentence. <laughs> I, I was going to say, in, term, in terms of opportunities, you know, we, we have a, a very clear vision in, in Stoke-on-Trent okay. um, that's been articulated through the council and the three MPs Thank you. of what we want to deliver. Thank you very much for joining us, Joe Gideon, there from uh, Stoke-on-Trent Central. Stoke -on Central. Let's join uh, Jonathan Reynolds. And the point that will really have chimed with a lot of people um, was about immigration, that if you control immigration, then you will see homegrown wages rise. Well, I think what we saw from the Prime Minister today, and, and respectfully with that account we've just heard, is just not coherent. I mean, you had half the speech today from the Prime Minister describing how unfair and unequal Britain is after 10 years, 11 years of Conservative rule, and then absolutely no real answers to cost of living crisis, the energy price rise, the, the cut to universal credit we've seen today. And specifically on this argument, uh, that somehow this is all the plan all along. We've never heard of this until the last fortnight. The idea that all of a sudden this kind of chaos where you can't buy petrol, you can't see the food you need in the supermarkets, this was the plan all along? I and mean, yet, they're Keir treating Starmer's the response, government as fools, I think. Keir Starmer's response to this, to say... Still tonight, 100,000 uh, visas for immigration. Is that right? Well, Key is making the point when he says that, that there is now a need for emergency measures to make sure people get through this winter. They get the things that they need. But they've we got are you, not, Jonathan. We, we, they've got you, haven't they? They've, they've, they've really made their point that you still haven't, in their words, 
learnt the lesson of Brexit. No, it's, you're a saying... no, it's a pragmatic response to an emergency situation. Our broader point is this. For months and months, the Chancellor, the Prime Minister, the whole Cabinet were going around saying, what was it, the £30 billion plan for jobs. Well, where are they? Where, where was the plan for these sectors that we knew would be disrupted by the end of freedom of movement. We knew these problems were coming. But isn't they it 100,000 for drivers and they're, they're today? The and, and then 100,000 tomorrow, and then 100,000 for another no, no, six it, It's about making that. sure we recognise there's been changes to the labour market. It's got to be about investment to make sure Because the fundamentally, is there. you don't believe what the Prime Minister said. No, I don't right? believe the Prime Minister's you, case whatsoever. You don't Absolutely. believe that there is the potential for us to invest in our country more and create uh, productivity and growth no, I, I, I from within. That. I do want that. If I was to be as generous as possible with what the Prime Minister was saying, I, I think I have some sympathy for the argument that the very flexible labour markets we've had in the UK for, for now two or three decades have made some contribution to underinvestment in the workforce. But if you want to tackle that, well, you've got to be looking at what our plans are for the New Deal for working people. So you've got to tackle things like fire and rehire. You've got to tackle zero hours contracts. You've got to give people protections in the workplace against unfair dismissal. Now, none of that is in the Conservative plan because it's not a plan. It's but, a crisis of their own making but that they are now saying is a plan. I mean, their, their positioning tonight is that the Conservatives are, are the radical party on jobs, they're standing up to business, people like um, the Institute of Directors, and, and they're socialist, if you like, in their fight for workers' rights to see, to see wages here grow. I mean, they are, they are straddling this huge portion of, of political and economic ground that used to be yours. Well, you, you might say they're making it up as they go along because we didn't see or hear any of this but for, people are buying until it. the last four. Well, are they? Because I think increasingly, if you look at where the delivery will be, and eventually the Prime Minister will have to deliver, we have no idea what levelling up means. We have no idea, really, what the plan actually will entail. At some point, you'll have to deliver, and people will find and see that really this is an emperor who has no clothes on. There is no plan here. If he was serious about driving up wages, let's make the minimum wage £10 an hour for all age groups now. That's the kind of difference you could make. Make. Let's look well, at these situations. He might be doing that. I mean, I think that's what we're hearing about in the budget, that he's... Obviously, you know that the party in power cannot actually control the level of the minimum wage that's set by an outside statutory body, but they can bring forward the date at which the wage goes up. Well, you had the government brought in what it called the national living wage, which wasn't really the living wage, but I know it gets confusing, but they have set a level, and actually they've come away from that, that consensus building, which was the original basis for the minimum wage. Well, you're we probably say, saying £15 yeah, pounds an we, hour. Is we, that we, where you're ten, going? Ten pounds an hour for all age groups. Don't forget, there are still major differentials in the minimum wage of the 18 to 20 20 year old rate for instance mm. is £6.56 an hour so if you had a £10 minimum wage across all age groups for someone in care for an average care worker a, a rise of £2,000 a year the fact is on the decisions you could really make to really push up pay the Prime Minister hasn't made them and but, he won't make them because he's making it up as he goes along but when this they, was when not they a make plan. the point and, and they try and find the dividing lines between you and them they like levelling down we like levelling up that's what he said. I mean, you are painted as the party that actually just kind of wants to cut off the top. I think his, his phrase was decapitate the poppies. I think that's nonsense. And I think it's the sort of, it's the kind of tired cliche that he used to write in his newspaper columns and now he has taken to be Prime Minister. And yes, I think some people now and again buy it. He has a certain sort of charm to the act. But again, where is the delivery behind that? If he was really serious about levelling up, you know, that cut today, today, of £20 a week for 6 million British families, more than £1,000 a year. Then the they say who are, you want people to defend, depend on welfare. 40% of the people that affects are in work. As well as that, look, there are 20% of the people affected by that who are unable to work, they've got a disability or they've got caring responsibilities okay. for young children. Now, yes, I think we should defend those, but really, you can't defend a cut of that magnitude disproportionately in the Midlands and the North and say you care about levelling up. Running. People can't believe that. OK, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Now, just hours before that suicide bombing of Kabul airport, some Afghans who'd worked for the British were directed towards a gate which put them in imminent danger. Some lost their lives. Newsnight broke this story last month, having seen emails which showed they'd been instructed to go towards Abbey Gate after the UK government had warned of an imminent threat. For several weeks, we've been awaiting a response from the Foreign Office on what happened that day. Today, Seema Katecha, who broke the story, has an update for us. Seema.
Yes, Emily, you may remember that back in August we reported that some Afghan civilians, as you rightly say, had been told by UK officials to go to the Abbey Gate of Kabul airport, even though the day before the Foreign Office had issued a warning saying, please don't go there. I have that warning here. It said, there is an ongoing and high threat of a terrorist attack. Do not travel to Kabul Hamid Karzai International Airport. If you are in the area of the airport, move away to a safe location and await further advice. Now, the Foreign Secretary at the time was Dominic Raab. He was quizzed by the Foreign Affairs Select Committee about his handling of the um, Afghan uh, invasion there. And he said uh, in this clip, we can see exactly what he said. I saw that, that report from Newsnight about the email saying go to Abbey Gate. I, I, I need to investigate it. Um, but, okay. but, but the general advice, as opposed to individual uh, advice, and, and if there was a lag, we need to look at that. But, I don't but you will investigate and you'll come, uh, uh, you'll come back to us on that. Absolutely. Now, we've received a response from the government, and I have it here. It says, no new Arab eligible Afghans, that's the relocation scheme, were called forward to the airport after the Foreign Office changed their travel advice. It says attempts were made to contact Afghans already in the vicinity of the airport in order to direct them to place of safety, the evacuee handling centre. Now, of course, this still raises questions as to why these people were told to go to the gate when the day before the Foreign Office had told them not to. And the Afghans that we've been speaking to have said that conflicting and confusing messages were sent to them. And finally, Emily, I have a response from an MP on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee this evening. He said, it turns out the British government was adding to the chaos and confusion and putting more people in worse danger than necessary. It seems the left hand didn't know what to do with the right hand and it still doesn't now. Of course, the government strongly refutes that allegation. Seema, thanks very much indeed. Now, as we emerge from the pandemic, there have been increasingly loud demands for GPs to see patients face to face instead of over the telephone or online. The Prime Minister and the Health Secretary have backed a Daily Mail campaign on the issue. But with escalating demand and a massive backlog of non-COVID problems, how realistic is it for GPs to go back to exactly as they were pre-COVID? And is that what people even want? Our health correspondent, Deb Cohen, has been in Sheffield to understand what strain the system is under. Oh, hello, it's Dr. Alan here from Burley Health Centre. I got your message just now about, about the pain in your knee, yeah? During the pandemic, phone and online GP appointments became much more common. But is this move away from face-to-face -face consultations to more remote appointments here to stay? All right, I'll speak to you later. Bye. Recent NHS data show the rate of face-to-face -face GP consultations in England has changed little since the winter lockdown. Pre-pandemic, 80% of appointments were in person, and this now hovers around 60%. These are all the things that have come in that haven't yet been allocated yet. Dr Ben Allen is a GP at Burley Health Centre in Sheffield. Is it something that we can manage over the phone? We can maybe get them to take a photo? He says the pandemic has sped up changes that were already underway. The way that we're working now differently is primarily not because of COVID. It's because we are making changes to try and help more people. We've known for decades that general practice was in trouble. Um, as people are living longer, more complex problems, more medications, more things to do in the community, our workload ramps up every year. And the number of GPs that we have to manage that is decreasing every year. This strain on GPs is not a new one, and this increased pressure is being felt across Sheffield. A report on primary care in the city, seen by Newsnight, paints a stark picture. Local practices are now expressing genuine fear for the collapse of general practice in the city. This will result in disastrous consequences for the rest of the health and social care system and for patient care. Primary care is definitely under pressure. It feels a lot more significant than it has um, in previous years and years gone by. We all want more primary care, but the actual number of GPs per capita has gone down over recent years. The demand has gone up considerably, and obviously COVID has, has, has further exacerbated that demand really quite significantly. There's no doubt that COVID has had a big impact on general practice. With hospital backlogs, increase in mental health problems and COVID vaccinations, GPs say that volume and intensity have increased. 
Estimates suggest an increase of at least 25% in clinical workload. But pressures predate COVID. Funding for general practice has reduced from around 10% of the NHS budget to 8%. And over the past five years, the number of GPs has decreased by about 2,000, about 7%. Put bluntly, demand massively outstrips supply. Emergency doctors say that a lack of GP access is a key factor in the high numbers turning up at hospital. While well, GPs recognise that many patients will need to be seen face to face, there are arguments that simply seeing more people in person is not the solution to managing their workload safely. Because time is limited and demand needs to be managed carefully, clinical need should be what determines if someone has a face to face appointment. They say there has to be new ways of working, but this of course is not to defend those practices that may refuse to see a patient in person when it is right to do so. I think that the real issue is not um, whether people are being so seen face to face. The real issue is that there just isn't enough capacity within general practice to see all the people who want to be seen. and and trying to manage with a mixture of face-to-face -face and, and email and telephone is actually how we can create more appointments and manage more of the need. But that is a very unsettling to people because in the past, they'd ring up, they'd get an appointment, they'd be seen by, by the GP. And now, if we were to do that, it would just be whoever rings up first gets seen, regardless of whether they actually need the face-to-face, -face, regardless of whether they even need, need to be seen. It's just whoever rings up first. And that means that the people who really need us, who ring later, there's nobody to see them and we, we can't have a system that's that, it's just not safe. Despite this, there has been increased pressure from the government for more face-to-face -face appointments. Yesterday, Health Secretary Sajid Javid said people expect to be able to see their GP in the way that they choose. And last month, Boris Johnson said that every patient has the right to a face-to-face -face appointment. But not everyone wants to come in to see their GP. Data from this surgery showed that around 50% want to speak on the phone, 40% prefer online and 10% in person. And despite the drop in face-to-face -face consultations, the number of appointments overall has gone up. Ultimately, GPs say they need to increase in number if they're going to meet patient needs. But appointments might not look like they did in days gone by. Deb Cohen with our report. So we're going to round off the evening and indeed the conference week with the thoughts of our political panel and a look to the landscape. There's a kind of political man-spreading at work now. The Conservatives take up more and more of the centre ground. So where do the parties of opposition find their own support now? Craig Oliver, the former director of comms at Number 10, knows what it's like to see a speech go from script to performance on the conference stage. Kate Andrews is the Spectator's economics editor and Steve Richards is a political writer, broadcaster who hosts the Rock and Roll politics podcast and writes about prime ministers and before we come to you all let's just take you all through the um, front pages looking in particular about their response to the pm speech the times has pm hit by business backlash facing a backlash from brexit supporting business leaders as they, as they accuse him of treating them like the bogeyman over labor shortages and uh, the guardian has business anger at vacuous and bombastic pm speech uh, lacking a coherent economic plan after he delivered a boosterish conference speech uh, the Daily Telegraph, though, uh, goes on the planning uh, reforms. PM pledges no homes on green fields, uh, as Johnson signals softening of planning overhaul in his conference speech after that Tory voter backlash that saw him lose uh, Cheshire and Amersham. And the Mirror goes on the farmer's dilemma, uh, senseless slaughter, 100,000 pigs face incineration. Um, we will put the pigs to one side and join our panel here. Kate, first of all... Um, an incredibly, actually, interventionist speech. And when you read um, the business leaders, at least in the Times front page, saying it, it, it lacked coherence and we, we're being blamed for everything, does that chime with what you're hearing, you're seeing? I think it really depends on who you ask. I mean, um, I think if you were in that hall, if you were a Tory activist and you had been denied the opportunity to celebrate the 2019 December election, then it almost didn't matter what the content of the Prime Minister's speech was today. He was joyous, he was vibrant, and uh, he really brought some fun to his speech and they seemed elated. Um, if you're going to ask, I, I don't just think business, if you're going to ask people who have any real sense of how the economics work, you're going to have a lot of questions about the Prime Minister's speech. And I think he's playing a very dangerous 
dangerous game by embracing these labor shortages to the extent that he is. If you want to have a bit of sympathy for the prime minister's position, you can look at things like the lorry driver shortage, and you can see that in some areas, salaries have gone from 500 pounds a week to 1,500 pounds a week. And you can say, are there questions about what people are being paid before? Was it always possible to yeah. be paying these workers a bit more? Where I think the prime minister is making a huge mistake is thinking that you can get to a more productive, high wage economy by essentially having shortages and boosting prices. That's a very painful way to go about doing it. Okay. You want to go for economic growth, and that was absent from the speech. Uh, um, Craig, let me come to you. When you hear that, that phrase that it's all part of the plan, do you think that's genius or chutzpah? I mean, how is he making that leap? Well, I think it's really interesting hearing the critique from the economic point of view, which is, you know, this is questionable, and he left people with lots of questions. Politically, though, I think it was an incredibly astute speech. It was optimistic. The crowd in the hall absolutely loved it. And I think, crucially, it appealed to that coalition of people who delivered him into government in 2019. So I think at the end of the day, the people in number 10 will be thinking, job done. Crucially, I think he made a lot of difficulties for the Labour Party. You were saying that he's kind of spread himself out across the common ground of British politics at the moment. And I think he's really left the Labour Party in a situation where it's quite difficult to know how to attack him. How do you attack somebody who says that we should be having higher wages at the moment? And I think the person you had on from the Labour Party tonight was really struggling. And the Labour Party really does have to decide how are they going to attack this government at the moment they're struggling. Steve, over to you. What, what is the answer to that for Labour? Well, before I come to that, I think it's very important to frame what has happened today and this week, because it is quite extraordinary that uh, Boris Johnson has, in response to the shortages in uh, delivering fuel and in other sectors, put an argument advanced precisely in the same way by Tony Benn the leader of the left in the late 70s and early 80s, he had something called an alternative economic strategy. At its heart were import controls. And his argument for import controls, rather like ending free movement of labour now, was it would put up wages, it would improve productivity, it would improve conditions. So Boris Johnson's become a Benite um, in his argument. I don't know whether he did it by accident or, or what, but that is where he is mm. in terms of the issue of labour, the small L, labour. Um, and I think that will, over time, raise big questions internally within his party. In terms of, of the big L Labour Party, when you see a uh, opponent moving onto your terrain using interventionist arguments about the state and so on, you can either retreat and think, oh, that's it, it's all over, they've come onto our terrain, or say, right, they are conceding a great deal of previous ideological ground. We will claim that we are the conviction politicians in these areas and explain how. You have to be supple, clever, um, yeah. but it's never inevitably a defeat for an opponent when you see a prime minister moving towards you. <laughs> it's a slightly pyrrhic victory, I guess. Um, Kate, if, if, if Labour were offering this, uh, we would think it was economically illiterate, wouldn't yeah. we? We'd say there's there's no way in hell that they can do this. Yeah. So when the criticism from the Prime Minister is coming from the right, where's the ground for Labour? It's very difficult. Uh, the Prime Minister, a lot of people are saying that he's the ultimate centrist because if you're on the soft left, the centre left, you're going to love a lot of these policies because what's not to like? Ed Miliband came up with half of them. Um, but uh, speaking particularly of the energy price caps there, which the Prime Minister, even watching these companies fail, still isn't moving away from. Um, but look, I, I think the difficulty is that this has been economically illiterate for a long time. And I was watching one minister in particular throughout conference, and that was the Chancellor, because whilst the Prime Minister and much of his cabinet went around talking about the low tax economy and being the party of low taxes. It was very telling that the Chancellor was not using that phrase. Mm. He was being much more honest. He was saying, we're going to try to be more fiscally responsible, i.e. Prime Minister, please stop spending all this money, or if you do, we're going to have to raise taxes. Craig, uh, is, he, is, is he creating headaches um, for his cabinet? I mean, he, he was very much centre stage at his own conference, but he's quite often been centre stage at other people's conferences. You all know that well, um, at David Cameron's yeah. side. No, I remember very strong, very well when we were trying to organise conferences that so we literally had in the grid a Boris Day where we basically gave up because we knew that Boris Johnson was coming to town. 
What was interesting, I was in Manchester earlier this week, there was no sense of threat whatsoever for, for the Conservative Party or for Boris Johnson at all. He was seen at, there as very much the dominant figure in the party with no challenges against him. And if I might say, I think that we're being slightly unsophisticated in terms of our analysis of what this government's trying to do at the moment. Yes, there are some questionable policies. Yes, there are some things that are perhaps Benite, but it's also mixed in with a little bit of cultural politics, a bit of patriotism, a lot of optimism. And that blend is actually quite appealing. And I think that we're probably underestimating them by not really giving them a bit of credit for saying how much how appealing that is. Yes, there are going to be problems coming forward. There are going to be huge waiting lists in the NHS. Gas prices rising is a real problem. Both of those are very difficult for the kind of people that they need to keep on their side. Okay, I know you want to come back and then I'll go to Steve. Optimism doesn't pay the bills. And the problem for Boris Johnson is not the Labour Party. It's not his backbencher MPs, many of whom are grateful to him to have their seat in the first place. It's going to be external events. And if you start to couple the cuts to universal credit, which I, I think the government can defend, but no doubt it's going to be painful, uh, the rise in electricity electricity bills this winter, inflation, which the Bank of England thinks is going up to 4%, the markets now think it go up to 6 or 7%, you're now starting to look at a real cost of living crisis. Is that the end of the road for the Prime Minister with his huge majority? Probably not, but it's going to become more and more politically difficult for him just to talk about the optimism Steve, when he refuses to acknowledge the cost of living that goes hand in hand with it. At what point do you think that the wheels come off here? Or do you think that the, you know, the tracks just change? Well, I agree with Craig. At the moment, uh, Boris Johnson is omnipotent, and that's based largely on the election victory in December 2019 and a huge opinion, well, not huge, but a, a, a substantial or significant opinion poll lead. Uh, he, he will become much less authoritative if that poll lead goes. Opinion polls, however reliable or unreliable, determine the way leaders are perceived, and his strength is derived from that. But the, I wouldn't, you know, I agree with Craig about the potentially potent mix of all of this, but it does have to be coherent, and it does have to relate to reality. Now, the reality is these labour shortages, to give one example of many, are causing real problems now. Okay. And it was nothing from that speech to address those real problems. There are many other examples of incoherence and internal tensions that will surface in the coming Wait. years. This isn't a party of all of them signed up to Tony Benn's alternative economic strategy to give Wait. one example. OK, we have to come out there, but thank you all very much indeed. Thanks for joining us. Uh, that is all from us tonight. Emma is here with you tomorrow. Till then, good night from all of us here. Bye-bye.